Lesson 1. Places to live. Part 1. Monster cities. Are big cities wonderful places? Are they terrible? There are different ideas about this. William H. White writes books about cities. He is happy in a crowded city. He loves busy streets with many stores and many people. He likes the life in city parks and restaurants. Many people don't like big cities. They see the large population of cities and they are afraid. Many cities are growing very fast. They are monster cities. A monster is a big, terrible thing. In some countries, there are no jobs in small towns. People go to cities to work. For example, 300,000 people go to Sao Paulo, Brazil, every year. In China, about 183,000 people move to Beijing from the countryside every year. Sao Paulo and Beijing are both mega cities. A mega city is a very, very big city. It includes the main city and the cities and towns around it. Mexico City is a mega city. It has a population of about 8,600,000 in the city itself, but there are more than 21 million people in the megacity. Tokyo is another megacity, with over 8,200,000 people in Tokyo, but over 31 million in Tokyo and the cities around it. London is another megacity. There are about 7,400,000 people in London and about 18,400,000 in London and the surrounding towns and cities. There are problems in all cities. There are big or mega problems in a mega city. In many U.S. cities, there are many people with no jobs and no homes. The air is dirty. There are too many cars. A terrible problem is crime. Many people are afraid of crime. People want to feel safe. Population density is the number of people in one square mile, 2.59 square kilometers. Population density is a big problem in many cities. In Miami, Florida, the density is only 7,748. In Bangkok, Thailand, there are 58,397 people per square mile. Is this crowded? Yes, but other cities are more crowded. Do you think William H. White likes Hong Kong? The population density there is 247,501. Part 2 My Neighborhood my name is Elena Sanchez. I'm from Mexico, but now I live in California. I'm a student here in English language classes at a small college. I live in an apartment building. It's on the corner of Olive Street and Sycamore Avenue. My address is 2201 Olive Street. There's a big olive tree in front of the building. There's a park across the street. There are a lot of oak trees in the park. The trees are beautiful in the summer. A lot of my neighbors are from different countries. 
The people next to me are from Indonesia. The family across from the Indonesian family is from Colombia. The stores in this neighborhood are always busy. There's a Korean drug store and an Armenian flower shop. A Chinese church is next to the flower shop. There are three restaurants on Olive Street. One Mexican, one Japanese, and one Moroccan Italian American. I like my neighborhood, but I ask myself one question Where are the Americans? Lesson 2 Shopping Part 1 Internet shopping. 25 years ago, very few people used the internet. Only scientists and people in the government knew about the internet and how to use it. This is changing very fast. Now, almost everyone knows about the internet, and many people are online, on the internet, every day. When people think about the internet, they often think about information. But now, more and more, when people think about the internet, they think about shopping. Amazon.com was one of the first companies to try to sell products on the internet. Jeff Bezos started the company. One day, he made a prediction about the future. He saw that the World Wide Web was growing 2,000% a year. He predicted that it was going to continue to grow, and he thought that shopping was going to move to the Internet. People were going to shop online. He quit his good job and drove across the country to Seattle, Washington. There, he started an online bookstore called Amazon.com. Bezos had very little money. The company began in a garage, a building for a car. And at first, there were very few customers, people who buy things. At the Amazon.com site, people can search for a book about a subject, find many different books about that subject. Read what other people think about the books, order them by credit card, and get them in the mail in two days. This kind of bookstore was a new idea, but the business grew. In a few years, Amazon.com had 10 million customers and sold 18 million different items in categories including books, CDs, toys, Electronics, videos, DVDs, home improvement products, things that you use to fix up a house, software, and video games. Today, at a virtual shopping mall, a group of online stores, you can buy anything from gourmet food, special, usually expensive food, to vacations. Fifteen years ago, Many people said, online shopping is crazy. Nobody can make money in an online company. They were wrong. Today, Jeff Bezos is a billionaire. More and more people are shopping online, and online companies are making a profit. It is a huge business. But some people predict, Online business isn't going to grow anymore. They say customers are afraid of online crime and they will stop shopping on the internet. Are these people right? Nobody knows, but we'll soon find out. Part 2 Predicting the future of shopping. 
There are different ideas about shopping in the future. Some people say everybody is going to shop online from home. There won't be any more real stores or shopping malls. But other people have a different picture of the future. They say there will still be shopping malls. In the future, many people will work at home alone on their computers. They'll want to go out to stores for their shopping. They'll want to socialize, be with other people. Maybe they're right. But the stores of the future will probably be different from stores today. Shopping in stores will be easy. First, people won't need to carry many bags from store to store. In stores, they will only choose products. They won't carry them home. The stores will deliver most of their purchases, such as clothes and books, to their houses. Second, people won't need to carry money or credit cards with them. An eye scan will identify their eyes and put their purchase on their credit card. Shopping malls will probably also be different from today. They won't only have big department stores and many small stores. Malls will still be places for shopping and for entertainment, such as movies. But in malls of the future, busy people will also do other things. They will go to the doctor, the dentist, and the post office. They will go to the gym too. Everybody agrees about one thing: shopping will be different in the future. Lesson three: Family. Part one. Changing families. Families in almost every country are changing. This is true in rich countries and poor ones. It is true in Africa, the Americas, Asia, and Europe. All over the world, families are getting smaller. In North Africa, in the past, many people lived in extended families. Fifty to a hundred people lived together in a group of houses. These were all family members: grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, children, and grandchildren. But now this traditional family is breaking into smaller groups. The traditional family in Mexico was also big. One generation ago, the average Mexican woman had seven children. Today, she has an average of only 2.5 children. Now, without so many children, families don't need to spend so much money on basics such as food, clothing, and housing. The traditional Japanese family was also an extended family: a son, his parents, his wife, his children, and his unmarried brothers and sisters. Three generations live together, but this tradition is changing. Now most families are nuclear families: parents and their children. And most Japanese parents have only one or two children. These families have new problems. Many men and women spend a lot of time at work. They don't spend much time together as a family. This can be very difficult. Some young women don't want this kind of marriage. They get a job and live with their parents. They say, "I don't need to get married." In Europe, in traditional families, the woman stayed home with the children, and the man had a job. But families all over Europe are changing. 
The number of divorces is going up. In Germany, 41% of all marriages end in divorce. In Finland, that number is 56%. Many Europeans don't get a divorce, but they don't get married either. In much of Europe, many people live alone. In France, more than 26% of women between age 30 and 34 live alone, and more than 27% of men of the same age live alone. The number of single parent families is going up too. In Denmark, 60% of all firstborn children have parents who are not married. The world is changing, and families are changing too. There are many new types of families, but most seem to be getting smaller. Part 2 Our Family Reunion These are pictures of my family. I took the pictures last summer. We don't live together. We live in different cities, different states, and two countries. But we often talk to each other on the phone or send email. Every summer, All the relatives come together for a week. This is our family reunion, and it's so much fun. There are two branches in our family one branch from Mexico and one from the United States. People come to the reunion from California, Arizona, New York, and Florida. Other people come from Mexico City and Puerto Vallarta. We alternate the reunion place, one year in Mexico and the next year in Arizona. My great grandparents lived in Puerto Vallarta, and my grandparents now live in Arizona. At the reunion, we have a picnic one day. We play baseball, swim, and eat a lot. We play volleyball, too. The women and girls are on one team, and the men and boys are on the other. One day, some of us go shopping. One night, we always have a big barbecue. We sit around a fire, tell stories, and eat a lot. Some of my aunts and uncles sing and play music. On the last night, we have a dinner dance at a nice hotel. We listen to music. Dance and eat a lot. Our family really likes to eat. We don't only eat, we visit with each other all week. We talk about problems. We plan weddings and cry about divorces. Sometimes we argue. All bring their new babies, new wives and husbands. And new girlfriends and boyfriends. It's good to have a big family. But at the end of the week, I'm always very tired. I'm happy to be alone. Lesson 4 Personal Health Part 1 Health News for Body and Mind. Nobody wants to be sick. Everyone wants to be healthy, and most people want to have a long life, too. But a healthy body is not enough. We all want both physical and mental health. What can we do to stay well? Most of us know some things to do. It's a good idea to exercise, for example, in a gym, eat fruit, vegetables, and fish, and drink lots of water. We also know things not to do. It's a bad idea to eat a lot of junk food, such as chips, ice cream, 
candy, donuts, and other foods with sugar or fat. It's a bad idea to be a couch potato, a person who watches a lot of TV and doesn't exercise. It's a terrible idea to smoke. But scientists now have new information about other ways to stay healthy. Some of it is surprising. Drink cocoa. Several beverages are good for the health. Orange juice has vitamin C. Milk has calcium. Black tea and green tea are good for health too. They have antioxidants. These fight diseases such as cancer and heart disease. Most people know this. But most people don't know about cocoa, hot chocolate. They enjoy the sweet chocolatey beverage, but they don't know about its antioxidants. It has more antioxidants than tea. Relax. Too much stress, which is worry about problems in life, is not good for physical health. For example, it makes your blood pressure go up. Now we know more. Some stress is chronic, which means that it lasts a long time. For many months or years. Chronic stress can make people old. As people get older, they get gray hair and wrinkles in their skin, and their eyesight and hearing become worse. This is normal, but chronic stress makes people age, grow old, faster. A scientist at the University of California, San Francisco, Study stress. She can now identify how stress makes people age. It can damage, hurt, the body's DNA. The lesson from this is clear. We need to learn to relax. Sleep. One easy and cheap way to help both your physical and mental health. Is just to sleep eight hours or more every night. But more and more people are not sleeping enough. According to the World Health Organization, over half the people in the world may be sleep deprived, which means they don't get enough sleep. Sleep deprived people often have medical problems, such as high blood pressure, diabetes, a problem with sugar in the blood. And heart problems. It is also more difficult for them to make decisions. Clearly, we need to find time to get more sleep. But there is another reason. A new study from Germany found that sleep makes people smarter. The study shows that the brain continues to work during sleep and helps the sleeper to work on problems. You didn't do your homework last night? Maybe you can tell your teacher that you were working hard in your sleep. Learn languages. How many languages do you speak? There might be good news for you. A study from a university in Canada found something interesting. Bilingual people. Who speak two languages very well do better on tests than people who speak only one language. It seems to be mental exercise to hold two languages in your brain. Ellen Bialystok of York University says it's like going to a brain gym. Conclusion To have good physical and mental health, we need to eat right, relax, sleep enough, and exercise, both the body and the brain. There is a lot of new information about health. Some of it is surprising. We need to know about it.
Lesson 5. Women and Men. Part 1. Men's Talk and Women's Talk in the United States. Marriage is often not easy. Love is often not easy. Sometimes friendship between a man and a woman is not easy. Maybe a man and a woman love or like each other, but they argue. They get angry. Later they apologize, but it happens again and again. What's the problem? Are men and women really very different? Deborah Tannen says yes. Men and women are very different. Tannen teaches at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. She writes books about the ways people talk. She believes that men and women talk and think in different ways. She tells about some differences in her book, You Just Don't Understand. It begins in childhood. The differences, Tannen says, begin when men and women are children. Very young boys and girls are similar to each other. In other words, they like many of the same things and play in the same ways. They aren't very different. But then there is a change. When children in the United States are five or six years old, boys usually play in large groups. One boy gives orders. For example, he says, Take this, go over there, and be on this team. He is the leader. Boys also brag. In other words, they say good things about themselves. They do this to have a high position, place, in the hierarchy. In other words, the system from low to high. Position in the group is important to boys. Girls in the United States usually play in small groups or with one other girl. A girl's best friend, her very, very good friend, is important to her. Girls don't often give orders, they give suggestions. For example, they say, let's go over there, maybe we should do this, and do you want to play with that? Girls don't usually have a leader, and they don't often brag. Everyone has an equal position. Boys and girls play in different ways, too. Much of the time, little girls sit together and talk. They have conversations. Little boys are usually active. They do things. When children grow up, nothing really changes. Who talks more and why? Many people believe that women talk more than men do. According to Deborah Tannen, this isn't exactly true. She says women talk more than men only in private situations, at home, with family, or with a few friends. In public situations, in other words, in a big group or at work, men talk more. Tannen says that men and women often talk for different reasons. Men talk to give or get information. They also talk to get or keep a high position among other men. But for women, people and feelings are important. Women often talk to socialize and show interest and love. They also talk to keep their close relationships with friends and family. Conclusion Although a man and a woman might speak the same language, 
sometimes they don't understand each other. Men's talk and women's talk are almost two different languages. But maybe men and women can learn to understand each other if they understand the differences in speech. Part 2 He said, she said, a U.S. couple. Well, doctor, I'm beginning to worry about my marriage. My wife and I just don't understand each other. She doesn't like to do things with me. She won't play tennis or baseball with me. She doesn't like to fix the car with me. She doesn't work on the house with me, you know, paint the house or fix the roof. She doesn't listen when I talk about interesting things, sports, money, or world politics. Sometimes she gets angry with me about unimportant things. And she talks and talks and talks about uninteresting things. What's wrong with her? Well, doctor, I'm beginning to worry about my marriage. My husband and I just don't understand each other. We both work full time, but I do all the work at home. You know, fix dinner, wash clothes, and clean the house. His life is easy. He has only one job. I have two. Sometimes I feel so lonely. When he's home, he reads the newspaper or watches TV. He doesn't talk with me, he talks at me. He only talks with his friends. He doesn't listen if I tell him about my day. He isn't interested in our friends and relatives. Sometimes he gives me orders. Sometimes he tells me about sports or politics, but I don't like it because I feel like a student in school. What's wrong with him? Lesson 6 Sleep and Dream Part 1 The Purpose of Sleep and Dreams. Many people wonder why do we sleep? Why do we dream? They ask themselves the purpose or reason. There are many theories or opinions about this, but scientists don't know if these ideas are correct. Theories of Sleep One theory of sleep says that during the day, we use many important chemicals in our bodies and brains. We need sleep to make new chemicals and repair or fix our bodies. This theory is called the repair theory. One piece of evidence for this theory is that our bodies produce more of a growth hormone, a chemical that helps us grow while we sleep. Another theory is that the purpose of sleep is to dream. Dreaming occurs or happens only during one stage or period of sleep REM, rapid eye movement sleep. REM sleep occurs about every 90 minutes and lasts for about 20 minutes. Some scientists believe that REM sleep helps us to remember things, but other scientists don't agree. Dream Theories Whatever the reason for sleep, everyone sleeps and everyone dreams every night. Many times we don't remember our dreams, but we still dream. Like sleep, no one knows exactly why we dream or what dreams mean. There have been many theories about dreams throughout history. Many cultures believe that dreams can predict the future, 
that they can tell us what is going to happen to us. However, some people believe that dreams are only a form of entertainment. Psychologists, such as Sigmund Freud, say that dreams are not predictions of the future. Psychologists have strong beliefs about dreams. However, these scientists don't always agree with each other. There are several different theories about the purpose of dreaming. Freud, who wrote around the year 1900, said that dreams can tell us about our emotions, feelings, and desires or wishes. Freud believed that our dreams are full of symbols. In other words, things in our dreams mean other things. For example, a road in a dream isn't really a road. It might be a symbol of the dreamer's life. Freud thought that dreams are about things from our past, from our childhood. Other psychologists say no. They believe that dreams are about the present, about our ideas, desires, and problems now. Other psychologists say that dreams have no meaning at all. New Evidence We still don't know why we dream. However, there is interesting new evidence from research or studies about the brain. When we are awake, many parts of our brain are active, for example, the parts for emotions, vision, the ability to see, logic, the ability to think and understand, and others. However, when we are asleep and dreaming, the part of the brain for logic is not active. Maybe this new evidence answers one common question. Why do dreams seem so crazy? Part 2 A Dream Narrative This is the dream of a 40-year-old businessman. He is married and has two children. He goes to a psychologist because he feels anxious a lot. The psychologist told him to write down his dreams. This is his dream from June 7th. Dream, June 7th. In my dream, I was in a large city. It was very big and very dark. The city seemed like New York, but it didn't look like the real New York. I was in a friend's apartment. It was comfortable. After a few minutes, I left and went out on the street alone. I walked for a while. Then I realized I was lost. I couldn't find my friend's apartment again. I started to feel uncomfortable. I tried to return to the apartment, but all of the streets looked unfamiliar and completely different, and I didn't know my friend's address. I began to feel anxious. I kept walking. I wanted to find something familiar. It was getting late. I decided to go home. I knew my home was outside the city. I saw buses on the street, but I didn't know which one to take. I couldn't find a way to leave the city. There was a way to get home, but I didn't know it. I asked for directions. The people answered, but they didn't make any sense. All their directions were very complicated, and I couldn't understand them. Suddenly, I was on a boat. The boat was traveling across a very dangerous river. It was dark. The river was very dirty. There was garbage in it. I couldn't see the other side of the river, and I was afraid. I began to think 
I'll never get home. I tried to ask for help, but no one listened to me. Then I woke up. Lesson 7. Work and Jobs Part 1. Volunteering Some people go to work each day and then come home. They spend time with their family and friends. Maybe they watch TV or go to a movie. Sometimes they exercise or read. This is their life. But for other people, this isn't enough. They look around their neighborhoods and see people with terrible hardships, sickness, loneliness, and homelessness. Other people see problems with the environment. Many people want to help. They volunteer. They give some of their time to help others. Volunteers help in many ways. Some visit sick and lonely people. Some give their friendship to children without parents. Some build houses for homeless people. Others sit and hold babies with AIDS. Andy Lipkiss was at summer camp when he planted his first tree. He began to think about the environment. In many countries, people were cutting down trees. Andy Lipkiss worried about this. In 1974, he started a group, Tree People, to plant trees. Pine, elm, cypress, and eucalyptus. They also began to plant fruit trees in poor neighborhoods because fresh fruit is often too expensive for poor people. Today, there are thousands of members of Tree People, and more join every day. They plant millions of trees everywhere to help the environment and people. Ruth Brinker wasn't planning to change the world. Then, a young friend became sick. He had AIDS. Soon, he was very sick, and he couldn't take care of himself. Brinker and other friends began to help him. In 1985, Brinker started Project Open Hand. This group cooks meals and takes them to people with AIDS. Soon, Project Open Hand volunteers were cooking many meals every day and delivering them to people who couldn't leave home. Today, volunteers prepare 2,000 meals daily. Ruth Brinker didn't plan to change the world, but she is making a change in people's lives. Only three volunteers began the Marine Mammal Center in Northern California in 1975. Today, there are 800 volunteers. They work with mammals. Mammals are animals that feed on their mother's milk when young. The volunteers help sick ocean mammals, seals, sea lions, and sea otters. The sick animals become well and strong. Motherless baby animals grow big and healthy. For many weeks, or sometimes months, volunteers help to feed and take care of these animals. They also work in an educational program that teaches people about these animals. The volunteers don't get any pay for their hard work. Their pay is the good feeling on the day when they can release a healthy animal, take it to its home, the ocean, and let it go free. 30 or 40 years ago, most volunteers were housewives. They volunteered time while their husbands were working. Today, both men and women volunteer, and teenagers and children, too. There are volunteers from all social classes, 
all neighborhoods, and all ages. Most aren't rich or famous. They enjoy their volunteer work. People need them. Today, the world needs volunteers more than ever before. Perhaps a young Zulu boy from South Africa, Nkosi Johnson, said it best. Before he died of AIDS at the age of 12, he made a speech that is now famous. In this speech, he said, Do all you can with what you have, in the time you have, in the place you are. Part 2 My Special Year My name is Pablo. I think I'm a lucky guy. I have a good family. And we live in a nice neighborhood in a really special place, Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. People travel here from many countries for their vacations. We have beautiful beaches, hotels, restaurants, shopping, and sports. However, in my beautiful hometown, there are also very poor neighborhoods. These areas are crowded and have a lot of crime. Life is terrible for many of the children in these areas. Some don't really have a childhood because they're homeless and live on the streets. They don't have families or education. They don't have enough food. Most of them have chronic stress. Many use drugs. Or have diseases or mental problems. Last year, I came back to Puerto Vallarta from my university in Mexico City. I spent one year as a volunteer with an organization called Outreach International. They have several programs. I volunteered for one program to help street children. It was the best and most difficult year of my life. I learned a lot that year. I worked in a home for street children, all boys at this one. It's in an old school that nobody uses now. At this home, the boys have a place to sleep and three meals daily, but it's not a school. They go to a neighborhood school. The home keeps the boys off the streets. It shows them another way of life. As a volunteer, I helped to prepare meals. I taught games such as basketball and football and art. I helped the kids with their homework. These kids can be fun. They have a lot of energy, but they're also really tough. Their hardships on the streets make them strong and not always sweet little children. At this boy's home, I met two other volunteers Brian from Canada and Greg from Australia. In many ways, we were very similar. We were the same age, came from good homes, had a good education, and liked to travel. They were both college students like me. We became friends. I helped them with Spanish and they helped me with English. They came to meet my family and we had fun together. Now we email each other. But more than anything, I will always remember the children. I hope their lives can be better in the future. The contrast between their lives and my life is big. I hope they can have a good life, like I do. Lesson 8 Eating and Food Part 1 New Foods, New Diets Diet of the Past. 
On March 26, 1662, Samuel Pepys and four friends had lunch at his home in London, England. They ate beef, cheese, two kinds of fish, and six chickens. Today, we might wonder, what? No fruits? No vegetables? More than 300 years ago, people in Europe ate differently from today. They look different, too. In famous paintings by Titian, Rubens, and other artists, people weren't thin, they were overweight. But people 300 years ago thought, how attractive, not how ugly. Today's Diet Today, people are learning more about health. Many people are changing their ways of eating. They're eating a lot of fruits and vegetables. Many of the vegetables are raw. They aren't cooked because cooking takes away some vitamins, such as vitamins A, B, and C. People are eating less sugar. They're eating low-fat foods. They're not eating much red meat. They're drinking less cola and coffee. Trying to be thin. People these days want to be slim, not fat. Sometimes people in North America go a little crazy to lose pounds. Thousands of them join gyms and diet groups, go to special diet doctors, or spend a lot of money at diet centers. Each year, Americans spend more than $46 billion on diets and diet products. More people are overweight. However, there is an irony, a surprising opposite result, to all this dieting. While many people are becoming thin, other people are becoming overweight. More people are overweight than in the past. In many countries, there is a serious problem with obesity. In other words, a condition of being very overweight. There are two main reasons. First, these days many people often go to fast food restaurants. They didn't in the past. At these restaurants, many of the foods, such as fried potatoes and meat, are high in fat. Some of the dairy products, such as cheese, are high in fat, and others, such as ice cream, are high in fat and sugar. This seems similar to Samuel Pepys's party, doesn't it? Second, dieting doesn't often work. Sometimes people lose weight fast, but they usually gain it back again. Almost 95% of all people gain back weight after a diet. One problem with obesity is easy to see. Overweight people have more sicknesses, such as heart disease and diabetes. Sometimes people go crazy over food. Sometimes they eat very little because they want to be slim. Other times, they eat lots of bad foods because these foods taste good. When will people learn? Too much food, too little food, and the wrong foods are all bad ideas. Part 2 Eating Bugs Different cultures enjoy different foods. Sometimes a food that one culture thinks is delicious might seem disgusting to another. In much of the world, people eat beef, but the idea of meat from a cow disgusts some Hindus in India. People in France sometimes eat horse meat or frogs, and this disgusts some Americans. People in Western countries eat cheese, and many Asians think that this is disgusting. 
And then there are insects. Many people wonder how can people eat bugs? Children in the US make horrible faces and say, ooh, yucky. However, insects are an important part of the diets in many countries. In different places, people eat over 1,000 types of insects and ate them in the past, too. For example, people in ancient Greece and Rome ate insects. American Indians ate grasshoppers, crickets, and caterpillars. Today, in parts of Africa, people eat termites, insects that eat wood, and caterpillars as snacks. In Japan, some people eat grasshoppers with soy sauce. In small villages and in some restaurants in Thailand, people enjoy crickets and grasshoppers. In some Mexican restaurants, people pay $25 for a plate of butterfly larvae. In the United States, some restaurants now offer insects as a gourmet food. In China, people spend a hundred million dollars each year on ants. There are different ways to prepare bugs as food. One way is to boil them in very hot water. In Colombia, some people spread them on bread. In the Philippines, people fry them in butter with vegetables. In Mexico, people fry them in oil or marinate them in lemon juice, salt, and chili. In some parts of Africa, some people bake or fry them. In other areas, they eat them raw. However, entomologists, scientists who study insects, say that it's important to cook insects, not eat them raw. In the United States, a company called Hot Licks now sells candy with insects in it. Julieta Ramos Elordui, a researcher at a university in Mexico City, says that there are many good reasons to eat bugs. First, insects are a cheap food, except on a plate in an expensive restaurant, and they taste good. Some insects taste like nuts, bacon, mint, or cinnamon. Second, bugs are good for our health. For example, they often have more protein than beef or fish. Third, they can bring money to poor people who find them in the forest and sell them. In parts of Africa, there are seven pounds of insects on just one tree. This brings a good profit for very little work. Finally, eating insects can help to save the environment. In many countries, people cut down trees. However, they will not do this if the trees have insects to eat or sell. People worldwide are now eating foods from other countries. People in the West now enjoy Japanese sushi, a small roll of cooked white rice served with a garnish of raw fish, vegetables, or egg. People everywhere eat Italian pizza and American hamburgers. Maybe someday, in a fast food restaurant in any country, a customer will say, Give me a hamburger and an order of caterpillars, please. In the future, Insects might be as familiar to us as rice, bread, or beans. Lesson 9 Places to Visit Part 1 Adventure Vacations People like different kinds of vacations. Some go camping. They swim, fish, cook over a fire, and sleep outside. Others like to stay at a hotel in an exciting city.
They go shopping all day and go dancing all night. Or maybe they go sightseeing to places such as Disneyland in the United States, the Taj Mahal in India, or the Louvre in France. A different kind of vacation. Some people are bored with sightseeing trips. They don't want to be tourists. They prefer an adventure, a surprising and exciting trip. They want to learn something and maybe help people too. How can they do this? Some travel companies and environmental groups are planning special adventures. Sometimes these trips are difficult, but they're a lot of fun. One organization, Earthwatch, sends small groups of volunteers to different parts of the world. Some volunteers spend two weeks and study the environment. Others learn about people of the past. Others work with animals or plants. Hard work in the far north. Would you like an adventure in the far north? Scientists are worried about changes in the climate worldwide. They are studying how the environment is changing because of a warming climate. Two teams of volunteers, one in Alaska and the other in Iceland, will study glaciers, huge fields of ice that move very slowly. These glaciers are getting smaller. Scientists wonder why and how. Another team will go to Manitoba, Canada. This team will collect information on birds, mammals, and the amount of snow. If you like exercise and cold weather, these are good trips for you, but you must be in very good physical condition. Studying Ocean Mammals Do you enjoy ocean animals? You can spend two weeks in Florida. There, you can study dolphins. It will be exciting to learn about these intelligent ocean mammals. These beautiful animals can live to over 50 years of age. They travel together in family groups. From small boats, volunteers will study and photograph these groups. The purpose of this research is to learn about the animal's social behavior. Scientists want to know what dolphins do and how they live. Also, scientists want to study dolphins' health. For example, they wonder, is ocean pollution changing the dolphins' health? If you like warm weather, the ocean, and animals, this is a good trip for you. Digging up the past. Are you interested in history or prehistory? Then southwest France is the place for your adventure. Between 35,000 and 250,000 years ago, early humans lived in this area. Volunteers will work with archaeologists from France, Germany, and the United States to search for evidence about the way of life of the people from that time. If you choose this adventure, you will dig for stone tools and bones, clean them, and photograph them. In your free time, you can travel around the beautiful countryside in the south of France. Beaches and Biology do you enjoy the beach and like to learn about plants? There is an Earth Watch adventure in Yucatan, Mexico. On the north coast of Yucatan, there are beautiful species of plants. Unfortunately, many of them are disappearing. People dig them up and sell them for large amounts of money. Mexican biologists need volunteers to collect seeds, count plants, and help to save several plant species. In your free time, 
you can travel to archaeological sites in the area. If you love a tropical climate, this is the trip for you. Do you want a very different vacation? Do you want to travel far, work hard, and learn a lot? Then an Earthwatch vacation is for you. Lesson 10. Save the Earth. Part 1. The Ocean in Trouble. Many environmental groups are warning that oceans worldwide are in great danger. According to the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, 70% of the world's fishing areas are in danger. One reason, of course, is the huge amount of pollution. However, there is another danger, and it might be even more harmful than pollution. This danger is overfishing. No matter where you look in the world, on average, 90% of the fish are gone, says a biologist from Dalhousie University in Canada. New Technology Fishers are finding fewer and fewer fish everywhere. However, this does not mean that fishermen are not fishing any longer. Instead, many are using new technology to fish new waters as deep as a mile. Trawlers, large fishing boats, are using special nets on wheels and rollers. They drag these nets across the bottom of the deep oceans, and they pick up anything of any size at all. With these nets, fishers catch the fish that people eat, but the nets also catch marine mammals such as sea lions, dolphins, and sometimes whales. The Effect on Fish These nets also take species like squid, skate, red crabs, slackjaw eels, spiny dogfish, and orange roughy. A few years ago, people didn't want to eat these species. Now, you can find them in fish stores, in fish sandwiches at fast food restaurants, or in fake, not real, crab meat for seafood salads. The orange roughy provides an example of what is happening. This fish appeared in fish stores only about 10 years ago, but already the species is almost extinct. The orange roughy lives very deep in the ocean, up to a mile deep, in the cold waters off New Zealand. Scientists now know that fish in deep, cold water grow and reproduce very slowly. For example, the orange roughy lives to be 150 years old. It doesn't start to reproduce until it is 30 years old. Although the fish is nearly extinct, people still sell it in seafood stores and in restaurants. And of course, it may be in that fish sandwich that you eat at a fast food restaurant. Many scientists believe that present fishing methods will destroy all the large fishing areas of the world. Can anything stop this? Some scientists think that governments should stop the fishing industry from using some kinds of technology. But this will be difficult. Many of the big fishing companies have a lot of money, and they use that money to influence politicians all around the world. No fishing zones. Other scientists believe that governments should create no fishing zones, areas where no one can fish. Governments can police these areas. During the UN International Year of the Ocean, more than 1,600 leading marine scientists and conservation biologists from 65 countries urged the world to create 80 times the no-fishing areas that exist now.
Their goal is to protect 20% of the world's oceans by the year 2020. This is happening in some places. For example, the fishing industry in Britain is beginning to accept no fishing zones because the amount of fish that the industry catches is getting smaller and smaller. The fishing industry often argues that the scientific evidence is not complete, that we just don't know what is going on in the oceans. Now, scientists and environmentalists have to give evidence to show that the fishing industry is doing damage before the government will pass laws protecting the ocean. This takes time, and sometimes it is difficult to prove something like this. The magazine Science says we should have the opposite rule. Big fishing companies should have to prove that they are not destroying the oceans before we allow them to fish. Conclusion Environmentalists say that average people need to get together and pressure their governments to do something. The large fishing companies that own the big trawlers are not going to stop fishing by themselves. The environmentalists say that if we don't pressure our governments, there will be nothing left in the oceans but water. Part 2 Repairing the Environment Early Life on Easter Island Easter Island is a very small island in the Pacific Ocean. In the ancient past, the island was covered with vegetation, such as beautiful forests, and the surrounding ocean was rich in fish. The human population grew to about 9,000 people. Today, we know them for their art, hundreds of huge, amazing statues that are made of stone. Over several hundred years, the people created larger and larger statues. The Changing History For about 700 years, life on Easter Island was good. However, by the 15th century, people suddenly stopped creating the statues. Also, the environment completely changed. The earth didn't produce enough food for the population. The forests were gone because people cut down all the trees. Without trees, they couldn't even build canoes, a kind of small boat. And for this reason, they couldn't go fishing. The society was destroyed. The people were hungry. When Europeans arrived in 1722, there were only about 2,000 people left. Easter Island as an example. Scientists often mention Easter Island. They see it as an example of the damage that humans can do to the environment. They say that our Earth is like an island. When we destroy it, we destroy ourselves. They say that we are now destroying it. Like the people of ancient Easter Island, we are cutting down forests. Worldwide, the environment is changing. The climate is becoming warmer. Glaciers are melting. Pollution fills many rivers and lakes and the air of many cities. And every year, about 20,000 plant and animal species become extinct. What we can do Some people see this situation as hopeless, but environmentalists say that it isn't too late. There are things that we can do. Governments and big companies need to make big changes, but every individual can make many small changes.
All these small changes can add up. They can make a big difference. Here are just some. Plant trees. Trees absorb, drink in, the carbon dioxide, CO2, that factories put into the air. Buy organic fruits and vegetables, ones without dangerous chemicals. These are good for your health and good for the earth, too. Reuse containers. In other words, don't throw empty plastic food containers into the trash or garbage. Wash them and use them again. Also, use plastic bags many times. When you throw away a plastic bag or container, it stays in the earth for thousands of years. Don't use paper or plastic bags. Bring a cloth bag with you to the supermarket. You can use the same cloth bag over and over for years. Recycle things that you can't reuse. You can recycle aluminum cans, glass bottles, some plastic containers, and newspapers. Use compact fluorescent light bulbs. They last 10 times longer than regular light bulbs, so they save you money. Also, they use 75% less energy. One of these bulbs can keep a half ton, 1,000 pounds, of carbon dioxide out of the air. Do you eat tuna fish? If so, look carefully at the can. Buy only tuna that is dolphin safe. In other words, tuna from companies with special nets that don't kill dolphins. Write letters to government leaders. Ask them for laws that protect the environment. Tell them that you want the earth to be here for your great great grandchildren.